welcome everyone to our February 2023 edition of AZ Bio Peers. And for our new viewers, AZ Bio Peers stands for Professional Education, Engagement, and Resource Sharing. And it is a time when our life science industry here in Arizona comes together with thought leaders to learn about the things that will help them move their business forward. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Gail and Donna um, from Cardinal Health, and they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves as they get started. Gail, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Gail Freudinger, and uh, today we're going to discuss the medical device development process, uh, particularly as it relates to U.S. regulatory overview and guidelines. My name is Gail Freudinger, and I'll be your presenter today. I am the Director of Business Development at Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences, and I've been in the industry about 35 years. Um, I primarily have worked in the research, providing research types of analysis studies, regulatory market uh, access, commercial studies, late phase studies um, for small, medium, large biotech, pharma, and med device companies. And with me today is my colleague, Shauna. Uh, Shauna, can you give a quick introduction of yourself? Sure. I'm Shauna Osrimian. I'm a toxicologist by training. I've been in the field 30 plus, 35 plus years like Gail. Um, worked in consumer products, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and now regulatory with Cardinal. Um, I'm, I did my postdoc in, at the University of Arizona in Tucson uh, in the Department of Anesthesiology under Jake Gandolfi, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and the presentation here today has several contents, and I wanted to let you know that the presentation will be available at the end of this uh, presentation. Dylan and Joan will get that out to you. And I've also got resources that I've put together that are very helpful. A lot of them are from the FDA, and some of them are some key articles that will help you through the regulatory process for medical devices. Today, we are going to cover what is the FDA's role in regulating medical devices, the medical device definition, and then classifications, and there are several, a lot of definitions today, guidelines to developing your regulatory strategy. We're gonna go through all the various steps there and the types of pre-market submissions. And then lastly, we're gonna discuss where you can get help for medical device uh, resources and pre-market submissions. And then in addition, where uh, I'll, I'll kind of highlight some of those resources that I was talking about. Um, I also want to let you know, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or save them toward the end, and we're going to have time to address those today. And Shauna will be my, my co-host, and she'll be chiming in as needed. So thank you for that. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about the FDA. Um, there are three divisions of the FDA. One is for drugs, which is known as CIDR, and that's the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And then we have one for biologics, which is CBER, which is uh, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And then the one that we're going to primarily be focusing on today is the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. That's where med devices fall into. Um, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health regulate the firms who manufacture, repackage, relabel, and import medical devices in the U.S., and the CDRH, as we call it, their role is to evaluate the safety and the effectiveness of medical devices before and after reaching the market. It is their public health goal um, to help patients and providers have safe, effective, and high quality medical devices. The CDRH is known for being one of the most stringent divisions in the uh, FDA. So it's very important that you have your meetings well prepared, your documents very detailed and outlined uh, according to their regulations and guidelines. The FDA website publishes organizational charts and with the names and the contact information of the various divisions. Uh, there, within each of these three centers that I just mentioned, there are offices that, uh, with regulatory 
functional and therapeutic focus. So there's there's more than one office and their primary headquarters is in Washington, D.C. However, there are offices throughout the United States. And um, like I said, in my resource packet, you'll have these organizational charts so you'll know who you can contact at the FDA and they are published on their website. Okay, what is a medical device? We're going to go into some definitions, quite a few of them here. So the first uh, definition is what is a medical device? And that is an instrument, an apparatus, a machine, an implant, an in vitro reagent, including like the component part or accessory. It diagnoses, it cures, it mitigates, it treats or prevents disease or conditions. And the device affects the structure or the function of the body, but the devices don't achieve purpose as a drug would. It does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action within or on the body, and it is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of its primary intended purposes. This definition excludes certain software functions. So there are softwares that are medical devices, but not the ones that were related to data storage, administrative support, or electronic patient records. So there's our definition of a device. We'll be referring to this um, throughout the presentation. Combination products. Uh, do medical devices can be combination products. A combination product is at least two of these three regulatory components. So uh, a drug, device, biologic, any two of these can be what we call a combination product and does fall into the medical device arena. Examples of combination products include like pre-filled syringes, pen injectors, auto injectors, inhalers, transdermal pumps, patches, the FDA regulates each of these component types um, that are involved. And once one center within the FDA usually takes the lead and the Office of Combination Products facilitates jurisdictions. And in the on the FDA website, there is a, I guess I'll call it a tab, an area for combination products and how they're defined and who you can contact there. Other types of devices include in vitro diagnostics, medical mobile apps, general wellness devices and wearable technologies, and software as a medical device. So let's talk uh, quickly about in vitro diagnostics. And here's some examples. In vitro diagnostics are tests done on samples such as blood or tissue that have been taken from the human body. In vitro diagnostics can detect diseases or other conditions and can be used to monitor a person's overall health to help cure, treat, or prevent diseases. In vitro diagnostics may be used um, in precision medicine, that's where they're known as companion diagnostics, to identify patients who are likely to benefit from specific treatments or therapies. Examples uh, include like next generation sequencing tests, which scan a person's DNA to detect genomic variations. The companion diagnostics market is growing parallel to the cell and gene therapy market, and it's estimated to be worth 9.9 .9 billion by 2026, so moving quickly there. Some tests are used in laboratory or other health professional settings, and other tests are for consumers to use at home. Another type of medical device is the medical mobile app, and those are becoming more popular as we all are using our phones on a daily basis. A medical a mobile medical app is a software application that can be executed or run on a mobile platform that meets the definition of a device and is either intended to be used as an accessory to a regulated device or transform a mobile platform into a regulated med medical device. Apps that are medical devices currently on the market can diagnose abnormal heart rhythms, such as Heartbeats app, which is shown here on the bottom, uh, transform smartphones smartphones into mobile ultrasound device or function as the central command for a glucose meter used by a person with an in insulin dependent diabetes. Those are all examples. Um, apps that are not medical devices are apps complying with an electronic copy of a book like an ebook or a reference work. Apps that are used as a training example by clinical staff or patients 
or apps that have not been specifically designed for the medical field. For example, a digital magnifier is not for the medical field. Another type of medical device includes general wellness devices and wearable technologies. And there is a difference. And if you look at the, the chart there on the bottom in blue, that compares a general wellness device to an actively regulated medical device. A general wellness device are intended for health and wellness and tend to be very low risk. They may or may not meet the definition of a medical device. They do not make any references, or of a device, excuse me. They do not make any references to diseases or conditions, and they're not medical devices. Actively regulated medical devices, the column on the right, can be low to high risk, and they meet the definition of a device and may make a disease-related claim. Some examples of wearable activity tracking devices are smart watches, skin temperature sensors, and perspiration sensors. They're used for physical activity monitoring of patients with cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, rheumat uh, rheumatic diseases, Alzheimer's, and patients who underwent any kind of bariatric surgery, for example. Um, another type of medical device is software. Software as a medical device, which is known as SAMD, um, can diagnose conditions such suggest treatments and inform clinical management. It can be used across a broad range of technology platforms, um, commercial off-the-shelf platforms, virtual networks, just to name a few. They are considered software as a medical device and software that can determine the uh, proper drug dro dose for a patient, detect and diagnose stroke by analyzing MRI images, track the size of a mole over time and determine the risk for melanoma, and draw on data from other digital devices to determine risk factors associated with epileptic seizures. A pacemaker and an infusion pump are not considered software as a medical device. Okay, we're gonna be referring to the classes of medical devices throughout this presentation, and you've probably already heard of them. Um, there are three classes of medical devices, and you'll see here from this chart that's provided by the FDA, the higher the class number, the higher the risk associated with a device. Controls um, in this example are requirements that are provided by the FDA. We're gonna go through what those controls are. Class one devices are low risk devices. They require general regulatory controls. Most devices in this class are exempt from any pre-market approval from the FDA. So you can go ahead and put your product out on the market, but sometimes a 510K submission is required if it's, there's some risk associated with it. Examples include band-aids or bandages, handheld surgical instruments, and non-electric wheelchairs, just your basic wheelchair. Most medical devices are considered class two devices. I would say about 43% of medical devices fall under this category. The 510K is the most common pre-market submission that's required by the FDA for class two devices. Examples of class two invite, uh, devices include powered wheelchairs and some pregnancy, pregnancy test kits. There's a whole bunch of uh, other examples. Uh, class three, Devices usually sustain or support life. They're possibly implanted or present some potential unreasonable uh, risk or illness of injury. So about 10% of medical devices fall under this category. Vascular stents are class three devices and require pre-market approval. Um, approval is usually obtained through the submission of what we call a pre-market approval application, and we'll go through that later on. Other examples of class three devices include implantable pacemakers and breast implants. It's recommended uh, that you go to uh, a particular database that the FDA has set up, and it's called accessdata.fda.gov, and again, that will be in the resource list so that you can see all the medical devices that are listed in their associated classifications, product codes, and the FDA pre-market review organizations and other regulatory information. 
Um, when you're determining which category your device should go into, you're going to want to look and see where other similar devices have fallen and look up their product code. So this will be a very important resource for you. And I mentioned the general controls, which are what the FDA requires for these various classes. All class one, class two, and class three medical devices require general controls. Um, and here are some examples of general controls required by the FDA. You have your labeling, you know, providing information to the users, reporting on the medical device related injuries or deaths, um, your establishment registration, you know, registering your business with the FDA, listing your device, having a quality system so that your device is safe and effective um, on a regular basis. And then, you know, making sure the device isn't used improperly um, and there's no false or misleading information. Class two devices are going to need not only these general controls, but also special controls due to their moderate risk profile. And class three devices need general controls and pre-market approval because they're so high risk. Uh, we often get, you know, how long does it take to develop a medical device? We get that question uh, quite a bit. Um, and medical device timelines really vary by the type of device, you know, how many resources you have in-house, how many experts are developing the device, um, how many of those, you know, the regulatory process, available funding, you know, other factors. Um, here are the medical device development timelines for class one, class two, and class three devices. And you can see here, a class one device can take, you know, maybe two years or less to develop 18 to 24 months, where a class two device can take three to six years to develop, possibly longer, depending on, you know, uh, your resources, et cetera. And then a class three device typically takes five to nine years to develop because it's it's got a high risk, a lot of extra testing is gonna need to be done. Regulatory strategy up front and very important. You want to develop a regulatory strategy um, really to make sure that your development efforts are on the right track, will be approved by the FDA, and that you're doing all the pieces necessary and required by the FDA. Um, a regulatory strategy really means you're constructing a documented plan that describes the specific steps and actions required to successfully stay compliant. It also contains the elements needed for a regulatory submission. Um, you should really first identify a couple characteristics about your product, such as determining if it's fed, uh, technically a medical device. List everything you know about the product, such as, you know, what is the device? How is it to be used? What markets will be served? You should do a patent search on your device um, to determine you know, uh, if there are any other patents already out there, perhaps it's not as unique as you thought it was. So you definitely want to do that. And maybe, you know, your device is slightly different. You could still certainly develop it, but you want to look into the patents. Um, also, you know, patents are important for your intellectual property rights. If you're thinking about ever partnering with somebody down the road, when I mean, you want to get a patent for your device, uh, you want to think about some of those arrangements that uh, you might be having in the future so that you don't limit yourself on the intellectual property. Um, is this a new or novel product or is it a modification of an existing device that will totally impact your regulatory strategy? Sean, is there anything that, that I should add here? Did I cover most of it? No, you've covered it very well. Uh, oh. It's just a matter you want to have the prior art. You want to make sure that, like Gail said, that you were uh, your device is unique and you're not stepping on anyone's toes and and um, again for partnering and licensing. Now, Gail, you covered it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to be going into this section in quite some detail. There are seven guidelines for developing a medical device regulatory strategy. Um, the There's indications for use, the device classification, predicate device, performance tests that need that are required, data requirements, clinical evidence, scientific evidence, and pre-market submissions. And the pre-market submissions were actually going to break into a completely separate category and go through uh, 
pre-market submissions and then the overall uh, requirements by the FDA. So let's talk about indications for use first. You'll need to develop an indications for use statement, which is a basic description of how a device is intended to be used. And an indications for use statement should include the diagnostic purposes on the safety and effectiveness of the device, such as screening, real-time monitoring, et cetera. The intended population, you know, the age, the patient group, the diagnosis type, intended setting or environment. So here we're talking about home, is it in home or perhaps is that uh, at the supervision of a healthcare professional or in a hospital, physician's office, so forth, laboratory. And then any prohibitions on certain populations. So maybe, you know, due to differences in diversity, growth or development milestones, or perhaps geographical location, there might be some prohibitions there. So you do need to develop an indication for use statement right up front. And one of the first questions our consultants will ask you if, if you call and, you know, are thinking about, you know, which approach you should take with the FDA is, have you done your indications for use statement? So this is really going to carve out the direction you're going to go. The next step is getting back to that device classification. Is it a device? Is it, is it a class one device? Is it a class two device? Or is it high risk like a class three device? And the first steps to determine if a product's regulated by the FDA um, is to go to that database that I told you about that we'll have at our resources by the FDA. And you're going to determine if your product meets the definition of a medical device per section 201H of the um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then you're going to determine if an appropriate product classification exists for your product. Device classifications are grouped according to medical specialties. There are 16 groups and they follow 21 CFR 862 to 892. So you're going to want to identify the class and the appropriate product classification. And this will help determine the approach that you're going to need to take in terms of the regulatory guidelines. Once you've identified that cl class, you can now uh, start thinking about the regulatory submission that you need to work on. And this will also define the, the length of testing and the duration of testing and, and impact your timeline. So this is very critical. And again, here are these classes of medical devices by the FDA. Again, remember class one's the lowest and class three is the highest in terms of risk. So if uh, Shauna looked up her med device, found it was a class two, she knows she's against moderate risk. She's could be exempt from doing a submission, but most likely is going to have to do a 510K. So now she knows some of the resources she's going to need to do this and can go through what's required in a 510K and know what kind of work she needs to, to start working on. Um, the pre-market application is uh, a scientific regulatory documentation the FDA uh, requires so that you can demonstrate the safety and the effectiveness um, and so for a, a class three device, you're going to have to do the PMA or the pre-market application. And that is probably the most cumbersome of the uh, documents you have to submit to the FDA for medical devices. Um, when you look at moderate risk or high risk devices like class two and class three, you are definitely going to have to do risk assessment. Um, and that will be a section within the 510K and the PMA. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through those submissions. Yep. Okay. Guidelines to developing a reg regulatory strategy also include a predicate device in most cases. So what you want to do is after you've identified your product classification, the next step would be to identify an appropriate predicate to which substantial equivalence can be established. So in the 510K, for example, you're going to be comparing your existing to device to a predicate. Information which can be used to find a predicate includes names. You look up names of similar devices, the traded name for which it's marketed. Um, you could look up the manufacturer of the similar device. The marketing status, you know, the pre-amendments or post-amendments on the device, 
510K numbers for post-amendment devices, and then classification information. And most of this information on the classifications can be found on the FDA website. Okay, now what happens if you can't find a predicate device? So this would probably be a good time that you might want to initiate a conversation with the FDA rather than going blindly trying to figure out what class your device falls into and maybe you missed the predicate device that was out there somehow. You really should complete a 513G form, uh, which is a request for information from the FDA, and you must submit a description of the product, the proposed intended use, and indications for use. So again, that in uh, that uh, indication for use is always going to come back to you. You're going to want to have to do that up front. And then the proposed classification to the agency for review. So you might say something like, does the FDA agree with our determination of class two based on this, this, and this? And so uh, you're basically asking them a question about where you think your drug is classified and mentioning some of the issues you're struggling with, like you can't find a predicate device, what would be your, your guidelines or route for submission? And the FDA will respond to you within 60 days, addressing whether the product is considered a medical device, and if so, stating the classification for you, and whether it will be subject to any active regula uh, regulation or enforcement discretion. So this is a great opportunity to get feedback from the FDA, which is something that we always recommend, um, rather than going down a rabbit hole in the wrong direction. Okay. Performance tests. Okay. <clears throat> when you're dealing with particularly class two and class three devices, you're going to need to gather all the necessary design and manufacturing requirements, but it's actually required for class one, two. It's just not as detailed. Chemical, physical, biological properties, infection, and microbial contamination are important factors that you're going to want to look at. Um, so, well, many commonly used medical devices, such as catheters, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass systems, and uh, you know, so forth, anything that comes in contact with blood uh, could have contamination. Therefore, these devices require an assessment for uh, hemocompatibility, uh, risks such as uh, you know, thrombosis prior to submitting to a regulatory agency for market approval. So you're gonna to need to do an assessment prior. And I don't know, Shauna, do you wanna kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Truly, truly. Um, the things you have to be careful of, like there's a whole plus, or there's a, a system of, of toxicological testing and, and in, in de medical devices, it's actually called biocompatibility because you're seeing how compatible is this device uh, in situ in the body. And uh, one of the basic tests, is, for instance, is cytotoxicity. Um, does the device cause cell death and, and just by being in contact? And that could be another thing that you have to be aware of is, does the product have extractables or leachables that are, that are potentially um, toxic to cells? So you have a whole testing regimen in which to, um, depends on your type of device, and you have to also take into consideration the method of sterilization. For instance, if it's sterilized by ethylene oxide, are there any residuals? So um, it's just not only performance per se, but it's also looking at also the characteristics of the vice and safety is a very critical component. Great, thank you. Uh, the manufacturing environmental properties are also important performance <laughs> tests. Any mechanical risks, so again, um, as your drug has higher risk, you're going to have to test for those risks. Um, protection against risk posed uh, by the patient, uh, by any supplied energy or substances in the device, and protection against the risk posed to the patient for devices for self-testing or self-administration. You know, perhaps it's a device that is a sling or something for your arm, and it uses uh, some type of electric uh, current and that patient goes into the shower, you know, that could be a risk or a danger. So these are just examples. Um, very, very important, uh, the tests that are performed and probably would need an expert like Shauna to help you with some of that biocompatibility and sterilization and so forth. 
And in terms of me mechanical risks, that, for instance, takes into account devices such as knee or hip replacements. Um, with wear, are you going to start having shearing effects? And are you going to start having particulates released in the body? So again, these are things that you have to be um, aware of. And also over time, does the device hold up? So these are testing. That's why the testing regimen is quite in detail and looking at this, not just from a safety perspective, but also from an efficacy one. Efficacy, yeah, looking at efficacy. As and case. that's important too over time because these are the pre-market tests, but we're going to show you in a bit that post-market tests and surveillance is often are required by the FDA. So having this testing process in place is important because you're probably going to have to do it throughout the life of the device. Design and manufacturing considerations are one of the most critical phases for design or for your device's success. You know, a loosely defined and designed medical device cannot comply with the regulatory needs and it will probably never make it to market. So you want to consider intellectual property, as I mentioned before, right? And starting with a prototype in, in most cases. Um, design controls are defined under the FDA 21 CFR 820.30. Um, and again, this will be uh, uh, information about this will be in the resources list so that you have more details. But the design control guideline, it's a quality system approach that covers the entire life of medical device, starting from the design, production, distribution, use, maintenance, and obsolescence. Obsolescence, obsolescence excuse me. Design and manufacturing considerations should include all the steps in the process. So you've got you know, your planning, your input, your output, review, verification, validation, transfer changes, and then, uh, you know, transfer and then design changes. And really this could be a separate presentation in itself, uh, just the design and manufacturing considerations. Uh, so we're not gonna go into too much detail here, but just do know that it's an important piece uh, of determining, you know, your regulatory strategy and how much effort needs to put in, be put into developing, you know, and looking at risk pieces within each of these. Uh, the FDA also incorporates what they call uh, good manufacturing practice, uh, GMP requirements into the quality system regulation. And the aim is to follow good quality practices for medical devices and their design. The regulation provides a framework to implement the design control um, to a wide variety of devices. The framework delivers flexibility for both regulatory compliances as well as internal design and development process. Uh, so this is something that you'll need to follow. Now, we get a lot of questions about ISO. Um, and ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. Um, and they have spe their own specifications that are internationally known for medical device standards. The ISO 13485 and 14971 are widely used standards across the world for medical device quality management. Um, and, ICE, and we'll see here kind of the definition. And uh, ISO 13485 provides guidelines for the quality management system or the QMS. And a QMS is a formal system that documents the structure and the processes and the roles and the responsibilities. And you can see that here on the left-hand side in this pyramid so that you can achieve quality management. Um, but the FDA doesn't follow the ISO uh, 13485. It has different requirements for quality management that we just mentioned in the design piece in the slide before. Uh, so the design controls by the FDA are defined under that FDA 21 CFR 820.30. But ISO is known uh, internationally and a lot of people tend to possibly work with a manufacturer who could be located in Europe or Korea or somewhere else and so they're following the ISO 13485 so you know how does that compare to what the FDA is requiring and the uh, FDA's documents are somewhat similar to this they're just they're they're a little bit different so just know that you're going to have to kind of match that up Mm -hmm. um, but the pyramid on the left really is illustrating at a high level, you, you need to come up with your quality manual, and then you're going to want to develop your quality policy, 
And then that's when you get into your SOPs um, and your instructions and then the plans and the records. So this is really something that kind of goes hand in hand with the design and implementation. It's highly recommended that you be ISO uh, 13485 certified. So moving along, I'm still on the guidelines for developing a regulatory strategy. We're now talking about data requirements. So what data requirements will you need to be leveraged or will need to be leveraged for your medical device pre-market submission? And um, this is where you're going to want to ask yourself, is the device comprised of materials that have been well characterized chemically and physically in the published literature? So, you know, let's say that there is a predicate out there and your device is similar to that predicate. How similar is it? You're going to want to do a lot of research here and see what has already been published uh, for an approved or marketed device so that you can see how similar you are to that. And then how long of a history is there for safe use? And if there were issues, what were they? So that you can handle those same issues. Um, I don't know, Sean, is there anything I should add here? Um, it's always critical to look at the, as Gail said, the device components, and you're better off looking at components um, that have been used in predicate devices have a safe history of use and that prevents additional testing you you know if you can avoid using a novel component um uh that would be advisable because that'll that'll shorten your duration of testing requirements and get you to the finish line that much faster so it's it's good to and with predicate devices that's critical and if you can and you you cite the predicate device in your submission so FDA knows uh, it's been approved and they can always go back and look at the, the uh, you know, data that's already been generated. And it just it just um, is a very uh, wise thing to do in terms of getting to the finish line, as I mentioned. Perfect. Thank you. Um, if no evidence exists out there, you're going to need to develop your own valid yes. uh, studies and scientific evidence. And that gets back to that biocompatibility that Shauna mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Software electromagnetic compatibility, that route of sterilization. Um, so, you know, again, the biocompatibility is assessing the compatibility of the medical device within the biological system. Um, and it's looking at the living tissues and cells exposed to that device. And you want to have a justification as to why you want to new, use a novel material and, and, um, and do a complete risk assessment to say, this is why we're doing it. And this is why we want to you know, does it improve the device? Is it safer, um, et cetera? Okay, so there are the data requirements. And here's an example of a biocompatibility evaluation endpoints. Uh, maybe, Shauna, quickly, you could highlight how this sure. is used. And, yeah. Sure. One thing you have to be very aware of when you are looking at the safety of a device in terms of biocompatibility is the contact duration, it, you know, if it's just in the body for 24 hours, the testing is going to be a lot less than if it's a permanent device that's defined as being um, implanted for greater than 30 days. Another important component is what tissues are exposed. If you are having a device that's going to be in contact with circulating blood, then you're going to have to have a, a greater amount of testing to make sure that this device is safe. There's nothing, le nothing leaching out that, that will change your systemic exposure. And um, so those are very important, um, like skin devices require much less testing as listed above here. Um, all testing requires cytotoxicity. You wanna make sure you don't induce allergy or irritation. But as you go further down the line, you wanna make sure it's not causing gene mutation if it's implanted. And again, leachables and extractables um, are very critical because if you have a permanent device, you want to make sure, and you test for that, you actually take a um, device and you incubate it in a polar and nonpolar solvents to see what comes out and if it's cytotoxic. That's a very critical part of devices and a very um, basic uh, requirement for all types of devices. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, clinical studies are also very important. So the clinical evidence, and this is not usually required with a class one device, um, but 10 to 15% of class two devices usually need some type of clinical evidence or clinical studies, and almost all the class three devices require it. 
Um, you're going to want to know what your intended timeline for clinical investigations are um, to support the safety and eff effectiveness of your device. Um, and then the main design elements to record your clinical investigations, you, you're going to want to know your sampling frame, the number of subjects that you want to include, the clinical setting, you know, maybe it's a laboratory, maybe it's a hospital or a physician's mm -hmm. office, um, and finding those laboratories and, and places to do a lot of this testing is is tricky. And um, Shauna, she's nodding her head because she knows a lot of these <laughs> laboratories and has worked with them. I don't know. Do you want to just quickly touch on that, Shauna? Sure. Well, this is more for preclinical um, yeah. in terms of the labs that they are. Um, you know, pharmaceuticals are, are more widespread in terms of laboratories uh, for CROs, contract research organizations, and devices not so much. So you want to be very careful where you place your studies. Um, there's some labs that claim to be very good and, and, you know, conduct everything according to good laboratory practices. Some not so much. You want to be very careful um, where you pl place these studies because these are very specialized labs and that will impact your submission in a major manner. You might have to go back and repeat studies if you, you know, don't go to a lab that's well um, versed in devices. And that's something Cardinal can definitely help you with to select uh, contract laboratories that are robust and provide data that is acceptable by the agency. That's important. It's got to be acceptable mm -hmm. by the agency. So you don't want to spend the money collecting that right. data and then find out you can't use it. Uh, methods and outcomes are also important in uh, clinical evidence and studies. Um, preparing a pre-market submission. So interacting with the FDA uh, is always important and you have the opportunity to do what they call a pre-submission process. And that's establishing the dialogue between you and the FDA. Um, a pre-submission uh, process is usually a, a, a good idea no matter what, but particularly if you can't find the, you know, you, you're really unsure about the regulatory pathway, not sure if it's a 510K or a PMA, and maybe you have a bunch of questions about the types of testing that you need to do. Maybe you found a predicate, but you still don't understand how to explain the difference or why your product is better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's recommended that you consult with a regulatory agent to help you determine the best regulatory pathway and determine if a pre-submission feedback is necessary. And if you've never interacted with the FDA, I would highly recommend that you have some professional regulatory expert there with you. Uh, you certainly don't want to mess up your first meeting. You know, these are things that cost time and money. Mm -hmm. um, and your relationship with the FDA is important. Uh, so you want to develop that relationship and make sure that you get the best out of it because uh, these pre-submission meetings are going to be helpful to you. A pre-submission meeting, they fall under what they call the Q-sub program. And a Q-sub is when, you know, you get this opportunity to meet with the FDA for this, for this pre-market submission. And what's great about it is there's no fee associated with this um, and there's no limit um, on how many times you could do this. Now, of course, you don't you want to do that within reason, obviously, but uh, something good to know. And to do a pre-submission, you're going to need uh, uh, this meeting. You're going to need a lot of information, uh, particularly as it relates to what's the indications for use statement. Again, getting back to that key component up front, uh, the testing that you've conducted to date and, and how that uh, what those results are a full protocol for any planned preclinical or clinical studies, and a, a summary of the proposed regulatory pathway, and then questions where you're seeking feedback, and any other required administrative information uh, that's required on the actual uh, QSUB form. Okay. And then really what's going to happen here is you're going to get uh, feedback from the FDA, uh, and they're going to give you the direction in which way you should go. So this is a great meeting to have. Do allow time for it. Um, and there will be resources in the packet that include more information about the details here. But we've got a lot of pre-market submission types to get through, and we've got about, I don't know, 15 minutes left. So let's make sure that we cover these and leave time for questions. So there are several 
pre-market submission types. This includes the IDE, which is the Invest Investigational Device Exemption. There is the pre-market notification or the 510K. There's the pre-market approval application, which we call the PMA, mostly for class three devices. Uh, there's also the de novo submission, which is interesting, and we'll get to that in a moment. And then the humanitarian device exemption or HDE. So let's quickly talk about the investigational device um, or the IDE. The investigational de device exemption is a submission that's used when you're not bringing your product to market. Uh, so this is kind of a unique situation here. It's really for clinical resource, research or investigational devices. Uh, you still will need to collect safety and um, effectiveness data. And the purpose of the IDE is to protect human patients, which again uh, is the FDA's goal and requires approval by the Institutional Review Board. So you're going to still need to collect your safety and effectiveness data there. The 510K is probably one of the most popular pre-market uh, applications. And this is for low and moderate risk devices. Um, it's often required for class one and mostly for class two devices. Um, it's made by the FDA. The purpose here is to demonstrate that your device to be marketed is safe and effective, and it's substantially equivalent to a legally marketed device that's already out there. Mm -hmm. This involves demonstration <coughs> of the new device, and you're going to compare it to the existing device. And you're going to look at intended use. You're going to look at the technological characteristics and what's the similar, and then what's different and uh, where there might be concerns in safety and effectiveness and what types of performance testing you've done. Usually a, a 510K is often like 100 pages long, um, and that's not including any of the testing reports that could be necessary. Um, the FDA doesn't publish a 510K template for you to follow uh, when you're trying to prepare this, so you'll know the different pieces, but knowing exactly what to put in there could get a little tricky. So uh, getting some type of support um, in terms of expert regulatory, either advice um, or someone to help you put this submission together is, is really great. Then you can kind of piecemeal the different pieces and tests as they come in and someone can help assemble it for you and tell you what's missing because you're going to need, you know, the summary certification, uh, description, equivalence, uh pieces the labeling the biocompatibility if it's a software all the details there electromagnetic compatibility performance testing and so forth so it gets really cumbersome um, and can be uh, quite time consuming for you uh a 50 or excuse me a 510k submission uh has about 21 sections and um uh, I think the, I mean, I think I got, actually, let me go back. I think I know it says here in my notes. Yeah, the turnaround time. Yeah, it's about a 90-day FDA review. And there's been about 561 breakthrough device designations to date, and 32 of those uh, have been granted FDA approval. And that's from the FDA site uh, in March of this year, or yeah. So I will have that listed as a resource too, so you can see what those are. Okay, talking about the PMA submission. The PMA, again, is that pre-market application. It's for the uh, class three devices. And it's more in depth than a 510K. It's used to prove that your device is safe and effective, um, but it's, it typically requires the clinical trials on human patients and participants, along with laboratory testing, um, and the standards are much higher. So because it's a highest risk, uh, the FDA requires about 180 days to accept or reject this application. Um, the, if you're a manuf medical device manufacturer, you're going to want to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. Um, you're going to have to make sure the evidence stands on its own. Uh, the list 
here on the right is all the contents that need to be included in a PMA. We're not going to go through all of that. But again, like the 510K, it's very cumbersome and can be overwhelming. So it's recommended that you get help when you're preparing this. Um, and know that, uh, you know, it takes about 180 days. The PMA will complete its review or the FDA will complete its review of the PMA. And they'll tell you uh, if there is, you know, an approval order or an approvable letter or a non-approvable letter. So you want to get that approval order or an approvable letter here. So you want to make sure that you, you do it all in the right, right manner, if you will. Um, the de novo submission is when a device has no existing classification regulation um, and general uh, uh, special controls can apply here. Uh, you want to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness for the intended use, but for which there's no legally marketed predicate device. So, for example, you might have a test uh, that uh, a diagnostic test that can be used for multiple indications. Um, and there's really nothing exactly like that out there. And that's where you might want to do a de novo request. So, you know, deciding on whether do you go maybe the de novo route or emergency use, use authorization or one of those routes really is important on how much time it's going to take for you to develop the device and how much testing is going to need to be done. So you really want to work with an expert and run your ideas by them and see what questions you might have for the FDA. Make sure you're on the right path. Um, here's, uh, whoops. Excuse me. When you submit a de novo request, no predicate devices or regulations exist. There's no substantially equivalent uh, or technological characteristics uh, that change the safety or effectiveness. Um, you can use this instead of the pre-market uh, application. Um, and it usually is used for class one or class two devices. Something that's a little more simple like diagnostic testing. Uh, the acceptance review process, uh, you're going to submit your application and then in 15 days, the FDA is going to notify you if it's accepted for their review. And if it's not accepted, they're going to, uh, you have about 180 days to address what needs to be done. And then um, the FDA will put it under review and complete acceptance. Uh, they do a review first to determine, like I said, if it should be done, and then they're going to do a decision on the actual de novo, and that takes about 120 to 150 days. So they're all about the same uh, number of days. The humanitarian device exemption, HDE, is for humanitarian devices. This is fairly new. 8,000 individuals are granted this per year in the United States. It's exempt for effectiveness, and you just need to show reasonable assurance of safety and probable benefit. So we're just about to wrap up here, but before we do, I just wanna cover what I had mentioned before. There are post-market requirements too. So you've, you've got your device, you've got it out on the market, you did all your pre-market submissions, and now the FDA is going to tell you, hey, you know, it's important to look at severe or adverse health risks or consequences of your device. And if there are any, we want to know about it. So you're going to need like tracking systems, mm -hmm. reporting of the device malfunctions, serious injuries or deaths, you know, uh, registering in the establishment where your device is produced and distributed is key. Um, and, and Cardinal Health actually helps with the registration too, if you need any assistance there. But this post-marketing uh, Requirements are really important, particularly if you're in the pediatric area populations, uh, the FDA is going to have a lot of restrictions related to that. And if you don't comply to this, then there are grounds for withdrawing the approval of your medical device. Um, in terms of medical device FDA fees, I mean, there's obviously a host of fees with developing a device. I can't really put a number on that because the type of device really dictates that. But I do want you to know that there are annual FDA establishment registration fees. Um, and as you can see here, the PMA has the largest fee, which, of course, it's it's the most cumbersome 
uh, application to do. Um, and there are discounts for small businesses. So that that's a positive. Um, there are different ways of getting regulatory support for a device. You know, you can get a specialized regulatory consultant, bring them in house and they can help you with all the pieces. Know that you'll have to go outside for publishing and submission in most cases. Sometimes they don't know biocompatibility risk assessment or QMS or haven't registered anything with the FDA or something. So you might have to go outsource for that. Um, we also provide uh, regulatory services at Cardinal Health now. We're a bit different. We can do uh, a regulatory consultant kind of arrangement, but the benefit is that we have a staff of experts, not only in med device, but in drugs as well. So um, if you have a combination product, for example, and Shauna's working on the device piece, she can just you know jog over to Ash on the drug piece and and gather that information and regulatory advice there. We can also pull in the publishing and submissions very easily and piecemeal the documents as they get completed. Um, we have folks who know various types of med devices and all types of therapeutic areas for drugs. So that's some of the benefits of working with uh, someone that has a staff of regulatory uh, folks underneath their organization. Um, and, this is just an example of some of the services that we provide at Cardinal Health. I'm gonna leave this with you. Um, just know that we can help with everything from the registration um, all the way through to the PMA, if you will, risk management, biocompatibility, so forth. Um, and we do work for class one, class two, and class three devices, the diagnostics, the combo products, software, and convenience kits. Um, a copy of this presentation will be available, as well as my list of resources, which mostly includes the FDA references and databases, any helpful articles that um, will be in PDF files, and then these medical device FDA fees. And here's my contact information. If you have any questions or would like to speak to one of our experts to see if we are able to help you, um, just please give me a shout or send me an email. I greatly appreciate it. And that's it for me, Joan. So I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gail and Shauna. And um, you touched a little bit on cost, right? And the differences between the, the various levels and then the ongoing fees. Um, that is probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see small companies make as they're starting out establishing. And they say, Oh yeah, I can do a 510k and then surprise, you're in a PMA. Right. Um so as they're going through that process, what what resources are available just on a a, a what if, right? I'm not ready for a full regulatory consultant. I'm not ready for a, a consulting organization. I'm just trying to figure out how I put my basic budget together because I have to go to investors and try and get money to take my idea and turn it into a product. Where do I go? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll tell you, well, first off, you can go to the FDA. And, you know, I've looked at a lot of the resources and the FDA is a great resource, but it's cumbersome and it's frustrating because mm -hmm. they don't uh, speak English to me sometimes. Like it's, it, you know, they're not going to tell you if you do this, you don't have to do that. They're going to just tell you the specifics. Um, there is a source called Greenlight Guru that actually has a lot of little cheat sheets out there. Um, and I would recommend looking there. Um, and I think there's there's quite a few other resources now that have quick forms. Um, the only challenge you're going to run into, Joan, is at some point you really need to run that strategy by somebody to make sure that the 510k is right and you shouldn't be on the PMA. I hate to see someone spin their wheels in the wrong direction. Shauna, any comments? No, oh, I agree. I agree. And we can always help with that as well. I'm going to hold you to that, Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, as they go through the process, you know, one of the things that we found out during COVID when supply chains were greatly disrupted was all of a sudden, and this is especially prevalent in medical device, um, one of the electronic components or one of the raw materials was just not available. Right. And you had to make a component change. 
How does that affect your regular court time? Well, that definitely affects it. And I'll let Shauna talk to this, but I just want to mention in that design piece and the manufacturing piece, that's why that design input and output is so critical because where are you sourcing your medical device pieces? And, you know, what contamination occurs at the source? And, you know, if that vendor changes, what kind of risks does that mean to the medical device so it's all gets back to risk assessment um but yeah you have to plan for that in advance and i think that's a great example of covid and and some of our supply chains issues i don't know shauna is there anything you wanted to add on that the thing is that with that sort of change that's considered a major change so you'd have to definitely go to fda and say that this is the change and why and again um another thing that we can help with is also auditing uh, facilities to make sure that um, they are following the right guidelines. There is reproducibility. Um, you, we know the solvents they're using and, and the purity and whatnot. So that's another area that we could definitely help with. But yes, you have to be aware of that and, and FDA has to be made aware of it as well. Good point. So another question, um, we just got Medusa reauthorized, right, for another five years. Um, and FDA, you know, does their best to turn things around as quickly as possible, but they've got staffing problems at the FDA. And I know, you know, and on the biologic side, it's really extreme with, um, you know, cell and gene therapies right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are you seeing as far as, you know, how those staffing risks, challenges are affecting turnaround times at the FDA? It depends on the division, I would say. Yes. Yeah, let's, let's talk about CDRH, since that's what we're talking about. Um, I don't know, Shauna, if you have any feedback on that. I mean, I do know just working more on the drug side of things that the, particularly with COVID, um, not only the surge of COVID products, the surge of cell and gene products as well, um, the surge of, of biosimilars as well, have a, all impacted the FDA's turnaround times. Um, they are really doing more um, correspondence type of meetings, if you will, versus in-person meetings, which I do think cuts down some of the time. Um, not the most personal way to get questions answered, uh, but that speed, speeds things up a little bit. But it, it is really bottlenecked. And we've noticed some things are taking, you know, two or three months extra. Um, Shauna, is that pretty much true on the device? Very much so. Um, and I know FDA is hiring. They're really trying to bring people up to speed and fill the vacancies. So um, it's something that we just have to contend with. Yeah, 180 yeah. days plus you got to build into that timeline, yeah. really. And into your budget. Yes, and into your budget, yes. which is exciting. Sadly, yeah. So um, that was was really terrific. And I think the, um, you know, the long-term goal that we have at Easy Bio is to double the size of our life science sector in the next 10 years. Excellent. And so we are going to need the best experts and the best resources to work with our entrepreneurs from the earliest stage all the way up to our global partners here in Arizona. So we really, really appreciate the time and the effort and the insight that you shared with us today. And um, we were talking before we got started about you have an open invitation to come to Arizona. Yeah. So uh, we hope that we'll see you here sometime soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this session of AZ Bio Peers. And we'll see you next month.